Thank you everyone who is here tonight. Um, my name is Laurel and I am a grad global impact intern at International House. The mission of International House is to enable students and scholars from around the world to live and learn together in a diverse community that builds lifelong qualities of leadership, respect, and friendship. Founded in 1932 by John D. Rockefeller Jr., International House of Chicago is today one of 20 members of the International House's worldwide network. In addition to supporting the graduate student community through our Graduate Commons program, International House also serves the greater Chicago community as a cultural and intellectual center for a wide array of programs. Close to 100 public programs are held each year at International House, through the Global Voices Performing Arts and Lecture Series, and during the winter quarter, we're providing virtual, in-person, and hybrid programming. You can learn more about the different types of events at ihouse.uchicago.edu. The Global Voices Performing Arts and Lecture Series includes outreach programs with Chicago area, international organizations, collaborations with foreign consulates, music and cultural performances, and discussions and debates led by distinguished guest speakers, including those for today's program that we are so pleased to co-sponsor with Seminary Co-op Bookstores, the UChicago program on the global environment. In this intimate account of one of the world's most productive inland fisheries, Troubling the Water explores how the rapid destruction of a single lake in Cambodia is upending the lives of millions. The abundance of Cambodia's Tonle Sap Lake helped grow the country for millennia and gave rise to the kingdom of Angkor. Fed by the rich mud-colored waters of the powerful Mekong River, the lake owes its vast bounty to an ecological miracle that has captivated poets, artisans, and explorers throughout history. But today, the lake is dying. Hydropower dams hold back billions of gallons of water and disrupt, disrupt critical fish migration paths. On the lake, illegal fishing abetted by corporation is now unstoppable. A fast changing climate, meanwhile, has seen a string of devastation droughts. Troubling the water follows ordinary Cambodians coping with the rapid erasure of a long held way of life. Drawing on years of reporting in Cambodia, Abby Safe traces the changes on the Tonle Sap, weaving together vivid stories of those most affected with sharp insight into one of the most threatened lakes in the world. For the millions who depend on it, the stakes couldn't be higher. Abby Saif is a journalist who was based in Southeast Asia for nearly a decade, working as an editor at the Cambodia Daily and the Nom Pen Post and writing for publications such as Time, The Economist, Al Jazeera and Pacific Standard among others. She is now a freelance correspondent. Sabina Sheikh is the director of the program on global environment and associate senior instructional professor in environmental and urban studies at the University of Chicago. Her current research, Becoming Urban, Understanding the Urban Transformation of Migrants to Phnom Penh is funded by the Center for International Social Science Research and the Newburgh Collegium at the University of Chicago. Following the presentation, there will be an opportunity for questions, so please submit those via the Q&A function, and don't forget that you can purchase Troubling the Water from Seminary Co-op Bookstores. Um, I will put the link in the chat here in a moment, and now please join me in welcoming Abby and Sabina. Thank you so much, Laurel. Uh, thank you, IHouse and Seminary Co-op, and especially thank you, Sabina, for having me here tonight. Um, it's really exciting to be able to do this. Um, and I went to University of Chicago, so it's, it means a lot to me that this is my first event. Um, I think how we're gonna start is I'm gonna do a, a brief reading and then, and then Sabina and I will talk for a while. Um, and yeah, thank you all for being here. So I'm actually going to read from the end of the book. I think probably most of you who are interested in this know roughly how the Tonle Sap Lake works. But just a, a really quick overview because it might not make too much sense is uh, there's a major river called the Mekong River. Um, the river has a tributary called the Tonle Sap River and that feeds into the lake. Um, and twice a year, the water flows in and out of the lake which creates this sort of heartbeat motion for the lake. It expands. Um, the water floods out into the floodplains. It's what makes this a really 
extraordinary lake. And I'm sure Sabina and I will be talking about this a bit more, but just a little background so you understand this passage. Um, slowly and then very fast, the seasons stop working. In 2018, there's too much rain and too much water. In July, a dam collapses in Laos, sending its reservoir pouring across the countryside. Whole villages are swept away and scores are killed. The water rushes down the Sekong River across the Cambodian border. Thousands hurry to relocate as the river spills its banks, flooding 17 villages, destroying homes and crops. Already the Sekong, Cezanne, and Srepok, the Mekong and the Tonle Sap had been too full. A tropical storm had sent their levels rising and all of the lower Mekong was struggling with the floods. A year later, it's gone bone dry. A drought sweeps the region. In 2019, almost one year to the day after the dams collapse, the level of the Mekong dips to a record low. An entire dam reservoir in Thailand dries up, revealing the remains of a temple drowned decades earlier. In Laos, less than half the land can be planted on. The Mekong slows to a drip, and so there is no fresh water to push out the salt spilling into Vietnam's delta, destroying crops by the ton. The Tonle Sap gets one good fishing year, 2018, and then no more. In 2019, the river reverses course months late, and that lasts just six weeks instead of the usual five months. When the lake reaches its maximum volume, it is half the average. In 2020, until a series of brutal flash floods arrive in October, the river never quite reverses course. For nearly the whole wet season, the height of the Tonle Sap stays too low to push any significant amount of water upstream. The volume of the lake reaches just a quarter of its average. Once again, fishers say the same thing. We've never seen it like this. We've never experienced a water level so low. Every year, it seems, there's an awful new superlative to apply to the lake. Recovery mechanisms have failed completely. In 2017, the fishing came back after the drought year. Debts could be repaid, stocks replenished. In 2020, a fisher might spend an entire day pulling nets and come up with this. A few eels, two snakes. The desperation is growing palpable. Set at the end of rainy season, the water festival is a glorious affair. Each November, as the water begins flooding out again from the Tonle Sap, a million Cambodians pack into minivans and buses and head for the capital. This water festival, in some iteration or another, is perhaps 800 years old. What began as a commemoration of Jayavarman VII's crushing evil defeat of the Chams morphed over time into a Thanksgiving of sorts, a celebration of the river's reversal, the fertile pulse. The nights are for partying, the days are for racing. Spectators throng the riverfront to watch long dragon boats manned by dozens. Two by two, the boats chase down the Tonle Sap River. By then, the water has become dangerous, deep and swift. Branches and tangles of hyacinth unmoored by the swelling river rush alongside the paddlers. Most years, boat overturns. On occasion, racers drown. In 2009, I interviewed a number of captains. Their biggest concern to a man was the height of the water. They were fishers. They knew how to swim, each assured me but did I know how they might get life jackets? We want to race to keep our traditions alive. It makes us happy, the rower told me by way of explaining why he took the risk year after year. Just one decade later, as their oars ripped through the water for the 2019 water festival, racers find themselves speeding on a river that has reached a historic low. At the bottom of the concrete quay where the crowds gather, a patch of browning grass stretches out toward the shallow water. The Tonle Sap lapping at its edges barely appears to be moving. In 2020, the races are canceled because of COVID-19. Too dangerous to travel, to pack the riverfront, too much poverty streaming across the country. Then too, the river never really reversed its course. What could there be to celebrate? I think I'll stop there. Hi, thanks, Abby. Hopefully everyone can see, see me. Um, I just, um, Wanted to thank everyone, um, the I House and uh, the Seminary Co-op Bookstore, and of course, Abby for writing this book and in inviting me to be a part of this event. Um, I also it wanted to just let all the attendees know, I wish we were in a Zoom meeting and not a webinar so we could see you all, but um, please feel free to post your questions in the, in the Q&A anytime. Uh, that way, when we turn to audience um, questions, they'll be ready to, uh, to go. Um, so thank you for, for that. I'm sure that there's a lot um, that we need to ask Abby about. So Abby, uh, but thank you. I, the passage that you read really speaks to the, the economic and cultural and social importance of the lake and the flood pulse system. I wonder if we can maybe just start with 
um, your process and how you, how you got here? How did you get from, um, you know, you told me you were graduated from the University of Chicago in 2006. I don't know how far back you want to go, but how did you get to um, studying and writing about the, the Tomli Sap? Uh, sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I got to it sort of in a roundabout way, which is um, I, after I graduated college, I moved back to New York and I worked here for a few years, um, but I really wanted to work abroad and I, I wasn't thinking about any place in particular, but there was a newspaper in Cambodia that was hiring English speakers, English language journalists. Um, and I had never been to Asia and I have to admit, I didn't know much about Cambodia, um, but it sounded pretty exciting. And I applied for a job and it was at the Cambodia Daily. Um, and it was completely life-changing as I think mm. any of my colleagues who have worked there um, could attest. Uh, and so I was there on and off for a number of years. And then, um, you know, as, as I mentioned in this passage, there's the water festival, you know, it's, it's a big part of life. Phnom Penh is the capital where I lived and worked is, is right on the Tonle Sap River. The lake is a huge part of the country. It's, you know, you, you can't live in Cambodia without being aware of the lake. Um, but I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't something I covered immensely um, until 2016, a colleague of mine, the photographer, Nick Axelrod, um, he was very interested at the time there was a drought and there was also a really bad forest fire, which we really had not seen forest fires um, in Cambodia at this point, um, not not huge, large scale ones like we see in the US. Um, and he wanted to go to the lake. He wanted to see what was going on with those. Um, that was in, I wanna say May, 2016. And so um, I accompanied him. There was another photographer. We went with a Cambodian uh, translator who's a, normally he works as a tour guide based in Siem Reap. Um, and it was, it was a really fascinating trip and we sort of all got quite hooked on to the situation. Um, and I wanted to do more reporting and I got some grants to go back. And I, the next year I went back with a, a colleague of mine, the journalist Trun Chansi, who's, a, who's an editor now of a new independent newspaper in Cambodia. Um, and I, I just sort of, you know, was spending more time at the lake and, and getting more into it. And then also looking up um, historical records. So uh, there's lots of books written by, you know, explorers and colonialists and um, even, even further back. And um, they all mention the lake because it's just extraordinary. It really is captivating the imagination of anyone who sees it. Um, and so it was really interesting because you could compare these like historical explanations and also just the oral histories of the fishers we were talking to, talking about what the lake was like even, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, or if they were older, what it was like when they were children. Um, and you got a sense of, wow, what we are seeing here is, you know, the lake has never been in this dire situation. Um, and then seeing it year after year, realizing this is not, you know, a one-off. This is not a few years of bad fishing. This is just a, a colossal change. Um, and I should say every, you know, all of my reporting, it's been very well covered by local journalists for many years now. And, you know, VOA and RFA and VOD and uh, Cambodia and Cambodia Daily and the Phnom Penh, but all these, all these publications, not to mention all the Khmer language ones um, have been doing such an amazing job covering this. So I'm not, it's not like, this is not an investigation it's it's all out there but um yeah i think i think you know i i was back in new york and it was kind of eating at me and i just started writing and that's how i a little bit of a roundabout answer to your question <laughs> no that's great i think it, it's it's very interesting how you wove in the history even ancient history or mythology into mm -hmm. the stories about the the lake and um so i i found that really interesting in, in how you were able to pull those together to find the parallels between what's happening today. Um, I, I'm wondering, I have one more question maybe about your process and then we can move, move on to content. But I know from, from my time in Cambodia and I see some of my research collaborators here, here too, um, that it, it's 
it's very clear in both the villages in, and in the cities that, that people have stories to tell and want to tell them. Um, it was quite amazing to me how forthcoming people were to tell um, very personal stories to strangers from the, you know, from the West. And I, um, I'm just wondering how you, how did you cultivate your relationships and decide whose stories to tell? Um, it, it's just, I'm, I'm sure you talk to a lot of people. So I'm, I'm wondering how that, that process went. Yeah. Um, like you said, it's, it's kind of an extraordinary place to report because people are really generous with their, um, time and forthcoming and, um, there's just kind of, it's, it's an extraordinary experience. Like it's, it's, it's quite different from doing it here. Um, I would, I would say my, my book is actually a little bit of a book of, I call it sort of a, a book of necessity and it's not, it's not how I wanted to do it ideally. Um, so almost all of the reporting, the on the ground field work reporting was done in 2016 and 2017 during reporting trips for um, like magazine and newspaper pieces. Um, and there were people that we met who were like, you know, just interesting and captivating. And, and we went, you know, we went back the following year and saw how they were doing. Um, but the way I really wanted to do it is I wanted to go back to Cambodia and, and spend like, you know, much more time with these people. And that wasn't a possibility. So there wasn't, uh, it wasn't an ideal situation. It wasn't, you know, ideally it would have been something where I, I really got to know people. I was really cultivating um, those relationships. Um, instead, I was kind of working off of this narrow body of reporting that I had. Um, and that's also what happened with the structure. That's why it's a lot of vignettes instead of deep into that many people's lives. Um, but I will say like one upshot I think is it, it highlights how omnipresent this is around the lake that this is not, you know, you if, if I had gone further into a few families, I think it might've been a, a, a better book in some ways. Um, but what I like about this is it shows how universal this experience is on the lake at the moment. Um, so yeah, I guess I guess to answer your question, I sadly did not cultivate those relationships to the degree that I would have liked to. Do you do you plan to go to go back and try to do that or try to spend more time immersed in the Yeah, I would love to. I mean, I I want to go back just to see my friends and colleagues. <laughs> um I I I do wonder about that. I mean, I yeah, I'd, I'd be curious just kind of a, even if not to write just at a personal level to see how some of these people are doing after a few years. Um, a few people we've spoken, like I, through, I've had colleagues of mine call and, you know, there's been phone interviews. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm quite curious about some of them and it would be, would be great to go back and learn more about how they're coping, if they're coping. Yeah, I um, maybe I can ask you some questions about the more about the content of the book. Um, so I thought it, we talk a lot about how civilizations were built on water. You know, even modern day cities like Chicago, right, is, is that was settled on on waters, and then we re-engineered the water to to do what we wanted it to. But um, I'm curious about if we can go back. Uh, can you? See, speak more to the ancient water management system and the relationship of the Korean kingdom to water. Um, I think one thing that was pretty interesting is to read about how it, how the changing water sort of led to the demise of the kingdom. And I wonder if you could elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, I mean, to me, what happened with Angkor is so fascinating. And you, a lot of, I think there's another book that came out fairly recently about demise of civilizations historically related to changing climate because even though this is the first sort of large-scale man-made climate disaster we're going through it's it's not the first time that climate has forced yeah. um, civilizations to change immensely but yes as you said uh you know the the success of Angkor completely due to water so you know from a, a sort of most simplistic standpoint it's built on the lake 
on the banks of this lake. It's a really fecund. It's able to grow rice to feed a lot of people. We're able to get a lot of fish. Um, but the the builders really went above and beyond. So it's known as the hydraulic city. And um, you can there's this amazing lidar lidar. I think that's how you pronounce it. I realize I've never said that word out loud. Um, there's these amazing maps made um, from shooting lasers from planes, and they show kind of the whole of the cityscape, um, even where it's overgrown. Um, but even without those maps, we just know that the city is super reliant on water. There's these reservoirs, the berets are everywhere. Every um, every temple has like a moat around it. They have the berets. They have um, you know the they've done some really cool like renderings of what the city looked like and um it's actually it's all on water so like within the huge temple complexes there would have been stilted homes and those would have it would have been flooded and so people are using boats to get around just like they use boats to get around flo floating villages today um and the water is moving from the mountains into down toward the lake and um there's these canal like channels kind of cut into the countryside everywhere it's just it's it's like remarkable i'm not i'm not an archaeologist so i i can't get into that level of depth but um you know every, so much of what they were doing was based on their ability to control the water um and it also means that you know they really really relied on that water and um what scientists believe now is they've looked at uh, kind of tree ring records and there was this really, really prolonged drought. Um, and that prolonged drought coincided with the demise of the Inquirian empire. And to be clear, like it, it's a slow demise. It's, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not an epic change overnight, but it's, it's pretty clear that, you know, over time this, this kingdom really diminished. Um, and until these records came out, there was a lot of different, I mean, there remain a lot of different theories about the demise and there's geopolitical theories, there's what was happening in the Siamese empire. But um, I think it's like fairly widely accepted now that drought just played a major, major role. You just couldn't support at the time, at the height, it was a million people and you just couldn't support such a like a dense, active city like that in, in the middle of a drought. Yeah, absolutely. And it's um, interesting to think about how we um, sort of engineer water for one purpose, um, like the hydropower dams, right? And, and the main of it, and the tributaries too. Uh, but then how that um, forces us to have to respond to the changes in the flood pulse in this case, through um, additional re-engineering of the water system. And I was asking um, one of my colleagues uh, in, in the research who's a hydrological engineer, and he was telling me about how they are, there are many projects in place to try to recreate the flood pulse system, like large scale engineering projects. But um, certainly I think what, what you've shown in this book and what we hear a lot about is that even if we could mimic the hydrology again that we, we can't replace some of the lost social and cultural um you know importance of the, the totally stuff i particularly the floating villages so I'm, I'm wondering if you could uh maybe speak a bit to the to the floating villages can you paint a picture of that for us for people who haven't been there and and because it's it's something that's just so um amazing that in the way that it exists and it's as you say, sort of vanishing now. So I wonder if you could paint a picture about that, but the floating villages and, and the people that, you know, from your book and, and how sure. dependent they are on the totally fat. Yeah. I mean, to be clear, I don't, I don't think, I don't see the villages completely vanishing or anything like that. Um, but yeah. Uh, so when we say floating villages, you usually we're actually talking about two kind of distinct types. Um, one, I consider them like real floating villages. So these are um, boats, houseboats, um, like vessels that are floating on the water. Um, and those, you know, can be anywhere from a few dozen 
families who are in the same area. Maybe there, you know, somebody will invariably have a, a shop, but there, there won't be a school, there won't be a health center. It's just something like um, Kampong Long, which is like a, re a really famous kind of tourist attraction floating village. I mean, it's not a, it's a real village, but it's, it's huge. Um, and that's got hundreds and hundreds of um, households and there's, you know, churches and, and schools and gas stations and it's where the fish buyers live. And um, so those are, those are real floating village that they're floating on the water. Um, and the, they're also moving as the water uh, goes out, they're, they're moving with the water, they're moving with the, um, with the pulse. Um, and sometimes people are, you know, they'll, they'll have really uh, kind of flimsy structures that when the water level is low, they'll keep it on a, a dry area, um, you know, near a market, say, and when it's higher, then they'll turn it into a houseboat. Um, then we have floating villages, like what I, I called floating villages when I was talking about Anchor, and those are these houses that are on stilts. They're really high, maybe 20 feet high stilts um, with stairs leading up to them. And so in the dry season, it's it's just a house. You you climb these stairs, you know, and a lot happens, you know, it's regular streets. There's cars and motorbikes and chickens and everything happening on the street, normal life. Um, but then as the water rises, it, it comes under the houses and it goes up and up and up and it gets so high, you know, it goes to the front door basically and then you're using boats to get around um and so it's it's really uh it's transformed you know it, lo it looks like Venice or something the houses are just sitting right above the water I mean the water usually hopefully doesn't get that high that would be a really serious flood but uh you you dock your boat at your stairs on your house and you walk up a few steps and you're in your house um so those are those are kind of what we would say floating villages. That's great. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit about um, the ideas, the idea of people leaving the villages um, and migrating to the city. I, I mean, I have in the villages sort of proximate to Phnom Penh, which is where I've, I've worked that what we found when we were last there a few years ago is that migration has really dominated the you know, recent household activity and its migration to Phnom Penh to work in garment factories and construction. Um, I don't, I think most people are aware of this, but what it seemed like from talking to people in both the villages and the people who've already moved to the cities is that it felt like migration was very much a last resort um, and that there were attempts to you know, switch to different types of agriculture or to engage in forestry or, um, fish farming and, um, you know, there's a lot of borrowing from microfinance, but ultimately it led to, to migration. And that sometimes you hear a lot about this push pull narrative that maybe there's the pull of the glamor of the city, but that we just didn't see any of that. It just felt like it was a, a last resort. And I'm, I'm wondering if um, you could talk a bit about what the, the people you work with told you about migration and moving to cities to work. Yeah, I, I feel really similarly. Um, I've, I've, report, I've reported a lot on migration in a lot of countries. And, um, you know, there, in most places, there is much more of a pull. I'm thinking of like Factory Girls, which is this really beautiful book about factory workers in China. Um, and, you know, so much of the dominant narrative is like, oh, these poor girls, they have to work these terrible conditions. And, and this book really got into well, for these young women, like this, this represented a really exciting moment of their life. And this was actually a way to take a lot of autonomy for themselves. Um, and I, I'm not saying that narrative like doesn't exist in at all in Cambodia, but I, I too feel like almost everyone I, I spoke to, people aren't dying to go work in, they're not dying to leave their village. They're not dying to go work in factories. I mean, sometimes like there are places where you can get really good jobs, like in Korea, they're, they're really well paid. It's very formalized. And, you know, obviously something like that is very appealing, but that's a tiny number of jobs. And, you know, most people are 
are going because it's just the families and dad, it's the only way to make money. So you go and um, you work in a factory or you work in a construction site. Um, the construction sites are really unregulated. The pay is very low. Um, not again, I'm not, this is not everywhere. There's exceptions to this rule, but just as a, I think it's kind of fair general statement. Um, you know, in factories, same problem. It's very, it's very low pay. It's not great conditions. Um, the rents are really high that the it's mostly it's mostly female labor force. Um, the rents are very high. The cost of living and the cost of food around the factories is very high. So, you know, they're going to earn money to save send to their family, but they're they're sort of earning so little that they it's barely it's kind of like very little is even getting to go home. Um, and so, yeah, like I think, like you said, people. It's not. I don't want to say it's it's a last resort because generally there's not that many in between options. But yeah, people are sort of they're going to take out a microfinance loan first. They're going to maybe try to do a different type of fishing. Um, you know, the the kids might stop going to school and they might help out more. Yeah. And then at a certain point, it's like no, we you you know the kids have to they have to go and and get other jobs um and that's sort of that's sort of what i was seeing in terms of migration on the lake but also from almost any rural area in the, the country yeah i think one other thing that we saw a lot of is um before potentially before migration to cities was like wage laboring on large scale like rubber plantations or tobacco firms and the conditions were were really difficult and challenging and um if people were not able to meet their quota, they would have to enlist their whole family in helping, which was taking kids out of school and other things. And it just was a, a not as sustainable way, way to, you know, uh, replace lost livelihoods or incomes. Um, so, I mean, even with the, you know, there's a lot of focus on migration and there's, there's um, quite a bit of current discourse on urbanization in Southeast Asia. And we, all, we know the, certainly the growth of Phnom Penh and the garment construction industries, as you mentioned, we, I guess, sometimes forget that the majority of Cambodians still live in the countryside. And that when we focus on migration and displacement, um, we, there are a lot of people who don't, who can't leave for one thing, or mm -hmm. don't leave um, and are still working in the countryside. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk about how you see this from your research, like how you see this changing in the next 20 years. I mean, do you think a lot of the people in your stories are trying to to live a way like that will no longer exist? Or do you see um, there still being this sort of way to be a small fisher or farmer in the countryside? Yeah, um, I mean, I should have, that, that's a really interesting point because I would say there's there's a, a third thing which is not migration, but it's staying and taking on day labor work. Um, yeah. And so, you know, maybe you're going and you're, working at the docks and you're carrying shells or maybe you know everywhere in Cambodia even in, in rural areas there's tons of construction and so like you're staying in your village but you're working on on these nearby construction um and so I think that's another you know that that's like diversifying your your livelihood in some ways but again this is backbreaking labor um it's very low paid even even lower paid when you're when you're out in a rural area. Um, so in, in terms of, you know, massive demographic shifts, I, I don't think I know enough about that topic to, to answer, but yeah, I, I mean, we're certainly seeing everywhere you go, small towns are growing bigger. So it's not just a matter of coming to Phnom Penh or coming to Kampong Cham City, but it's a matter of, you know, like the, the nearby town is becoming a bigger and bigger town. Um, yeah. And I, I don't think that's like inherently an, a negative, you know, um, there are certainly benefits that come with an urban environment. And I've, I've, I have so many friends who wouldn't be where they were today if, if they had to stay in their home village. Um, there's a lot of opportunity um, that you get by leaving your rural area. But I, I, I think, 
you know, at the end of the day, it kind of comes down to choice. And when it's a matter of simply being forced and then being forced into like really exploitive positions. I mean, we were only talking about migration within Cambodia. There's also a lot of outward migration. That's its own issue. Um, yeah, so I don't know, in 20 years, like with climate change doing what it's doing to the rural parts of the country, it's, it's um, yeah. Yeah, and I think um, to your point, it's not, it's, it's not just movement to the, to the big city, like big cities are emerging in some of the provincial towns. And um, it seems like as Phnom Penh continues to grow and real estate becomes more high valued, we, we might see factories moving into the provincial towns, which would provide the same kind of economic opportunities, but closer to perhaps the villages where people could maybe work, go back and forth, but. Well, and, that, and a lot of these provincial towns, there are, there is a garment sector. Um, yeah. Bigger and some, you know, in Siem Reap, it's huge, obviously, but yeah, um, yeah you, you are seeing that more and more. Yeah, um, so maybe I can ask one more question and then we can, we can open it up. Um, I, it, in reading your, your book, um, people have faced very difficult lives and, and particularly the older people and what they, they've gone through historically um, and how they're trying to, to survive now um, with this under climate change and all of these environmental changes. And so the challenges seem certainly seem insurmountable in many cases, but what's very strong is that their connections to place and their and family and the cultural identity, it's very, it's very passionate, it's very strong, it sort of binds people. And I'm I'm wondering if you could speak to that and how that offers a sense of hopefulness or, or optimism. Yeah, I think that's a lovely takeaway. I mean, like you said, I, the older people, we're all talking about survivors of the Khmer Rouge and um, with great resilience, they built a new life for themselves and they rebuilt their families in, in many cases. And, um, you know, I think that's, that's that sort of willingness to just go on in the face of, in the face of insurmountable odds is certainly there. Um, and that is a reason to hope and that is a reason to like have just endless admiration. Um, at the same time, I just first personally, I, I, I feel very sad and bad about the situation because like you said, these, these are people who are doing everything in their possibility to, to move forward and to kind of carve out as good a life as they possibly can. But it just feels like there's so many forces against them and there's climate change and there's what's happening with the dams and you know there's it's just it's it's very it can be very frustrating to witness that um but i don't want to i don't want to say it's hopeless um you know the, these the many of the fishers they're they're great stewards of the land and you know they understand how conservation works intrinsically and um I know you've done a lot of work on community fisheries and looked at like the possibilities for that. And we've seen huge successes with that in many countries. And um, yeah, and there's and there's efforts underway. Like I just heard one recently about they're, they're re-releasing like the Mekong giant catfish and a few other in, like nearly extinct species that they've raised from juveniles to to like young young fish adults, they're releasing them into the Tonle Sap and tagging them, and you know it's not um, it's it's not it's not hopeless. It's just it's not it's not hopeful either. <laughs> I guess that's how I'll put it. Yeah, and I'll just clarify to say that I have not actually worked in community fisheries. I've been reading about it, <laughs> <laughs> and I also from your book going learning about the fish lots and the community fisheries and then the aquaculture. So, um, but there are people out there who are doing um, very interesting work on that and and transitions to um, from fishing to maybe fish farming, which is not fishing, right? But it's um, it's is there a potential there? I I, I don't know, but. Um, I think there's a lot of questions coming up now, so maybe I can turn to, to some of these, even though you know I have a lot of questions for you. I gave you a whole list, but um, uh, maybe I could just read these to you so you don't have to um, try to 
if I read them, I'll just start with the beginning. Um, can you speak to what the Cambodian government has done, if anything, to address this issue? Have any policies been put in place? Um, yeah, this is such a tricky one. Um, the government has great policies and great laws, um, and this is true not just for the Tolnai Sap, but for the environment, for land laws. I mean, like it's a it's a it's a great laws on the books. Um, the problem is always enforcement. And um, this has been a big problem. I mean, this is what everyone complains about. There's just not enforcement of the fisheries law. So this is like allowed for widespread illegal fishing. Um, there's been huge, there was a great article recently, um, I think in VOD about clearance of flooded forests around, around the lake, which is all a protected area. And it's just, huge amounts have been cleared and turned into farmland and um it's powerful people that are doing that clearing and then it's really poor people who are renting this land for farming um and that's you know there's a there's a crackdown now and so that's great and there's like recently a crackdown of illegal fishing and and these things are these things are good like i you know i i don't want to they're good it's good the government's doing it but it's also why now? Why not five or 10 or 15 years ago? Why not prevent this before it got so out of hand? Um, you know, so yeah, there are, there are policies. It's just, you know, people are frustrated because they're not always enforced the way they, they could or should be. Well, there's two questions related to this. Um, one is, is there any way we can help with the situation, pages to donate, speaking publicly to bring more attention to this issue, which you're doing right now? I um, don't know if you have any ideas how people can get involved. Um, I mean, I would say it sort of starts locally. Like, I happen to live in Cambodia and I happen to get very interested in this, but we we see really similar things happening in the US. And I, I don't know if the person asking is, is, is from Cambodia or from the US. Um, you know, the, the biggest issue is the issue we're all facing around the world, which is climate change. And um, how do we work on that? Uh, you know, get, get on the streets or petition our leaders or I, I you know, get involved at that level um, in, in terms of the, the sort of distinct day-to-day -day way to help people in situations in this specific situation. It, I, I mean, there are NGOs, there are good charities working out there, um, but it's such a, you know, it, it, to me, it's just like such a monumental overreaching issue that it's it, it yeah. come down to an individual in some ways. I'm sorry, that's not the best answer. No, that's it's it's very um, challenging. And well, here's a more specific question about um, about this. What, what role did the Wat and monks play in these communities? Who's been helped, um, who has helped to advocate with those whose livelihoods are being harmed by environmental change? From my that's collaborator, funny. Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I have to admit, I don't know that in too much detail. I do know sort of generally that there, there have been, um, for want of a better word, activist monks in recent years who have been really involved, in, for, in, for example, in Prey Long Forest, um, who have been um, really engaged in, in community awareness raising and, and um, bringing attention to environmental issues. My understanding is those tend to be, um, it's more the act of an individual and it's not, it's not a, a specific pagoda, but, but of course there's, there's a lot of support that's coming just in, a, in an informal way. So for instance, some of the people I met, some of the, the poorest and oldest people, they would sort of set up seasonally on the, the lake, um, on a bank where they could fish and then in the off season they would stay at the pagoda and and you know this remains like a, a chief uh form of social security in some ways for many people there yeah i i've also um i feel like there's just that that sense of 
community and family that people is, is so strong and there's a lot of uh, informal support that happens. Um, I mean, we hear a lot about microfinance, but I think, um, you know, before that, there's just, there's a lot of uh, sort of community-based support of each other. Um, but, you know, if the whole community is facing hardship, it becomes more, more challenging. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of discussion about people as contributors, like small fishers or small farmers. And there's a question a bit more about the consumption side. How, have you seen changes in how people go about getting food? What strategies do people use for subsistence? Um, yeah, I'm sorry, your microphone was a little fuzzy, so I, I only got the, the second part of that. Um, but, oh, okay, that's fine. Um, I stayed in there. Yeah, so uh, this is very interesting. Um, one thing that really struck me being there is um, a lot of, I would go out and I'd see what the vendors were, because there's these vendors who, who come from land and they bring, you know, vegetables and food and meat out oil anything you could want to the floating villages um and they're increasingly bringing fish um they're bringing fish that's been farmed on land and they're selling it to the fishers um so that's like a big change in substance if you're not even catching enough fish to eat um but also there's just changes and people are i mean people report that they're eating less, especially in that really bad drought year, um, yeah. there just isn't enough money. So, you know, already these are people who are not gonna be eating meat very often, but, you know, they're just eating like the few small fish that they can catch, they're eating rice, they're, and they're just cutting down on how much they eat, unfortunately. And I will say there's a team of researchers at Johns Hopkins who are studying sort of changes in nutrition. So not only in say like the varieties of rice, but in just the, what you've described, like changing from eating um, fish to eating more rice or, you know, what the effects are in terms of nutrition, as well as studying what happens to nutrition levels when people move to the city and are consuming very different kinds of food um, yeah. as well. I would just add on that note, I mean, that like one of the most nutritious things you can eat in Cambodia is tray rio, which is like a very small fish. It's the fish that they use to make for hawk. Um, and those tiny oily fish, if we think of anchovies or sardines or any of those bottom of the food chain fish, those are so astoundingly nutritious. Um, and so it's, it's better if people are eating that than a farmed fish because the, the top nutrition the top food chain fish aren't as nutritious. Um, and that is, you know, that that's not changed. People are still eating tons of prohawk and tray real, but like that kind of change can really have a nutritional impact. If, if people can't catch enough of the, of the small fish and that's where they're protein and really critical minerals, um, that's problematic. Right, right. Um, so here's a question. Um, thank you for this discussion between landscape, labor, and love of place. What indicators would you focus on to best capture some signs of hope? Income, jobs, flooding? Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I don't think income is a perfect measure because, for instance, if we look at the garment workers, if they get raises, the cost of living typically goes up commensurately. Um, but I think um, looking at how much food people eat, if, if they have any um, savings whatsoever, if they can afford to send their kids to school, if they have like a little bit of money for a healthcare emergency, um, I think those are like really good indices to look at. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, like ideally land, but what we've seen is land is often non-productive and can be really expensive and people are spiraling into debt, trying to, you know, keep, keep the crops growing. So land in itself, unfortunately, isn't even, well, there, there's important value there to have a, a to, to have something that you can, um, you know, get loans off of and stuff that, that isn't inherently, um, it doesn't mean you're well off, I suppose. Yeah, and I think the, the ownership of land is very tenuous because land is often used as collateral for microfinance. Right. 
loans and then gets um, lost when there's not enough agricultural income to pay, pay those back. Um, and then I, I think to your point about income is really important because if we look at poverty, and like poverty has declined significantly in Cambodia. I mean, it's often cited as a success story if you look at poverty uh, rates reduction in, in Cambodia. Um, but anytime you see a lot of movement of people from the countryside, from farming to uh, cities to work in, you know, construction or the garment factories, regardless of conditions, you'll see increase, you'll see reductions in poverty and poverty is defined as um, extremely, extremely low. So um, I think Cambodia is also one of the places where there's a lot of people who've gotten out of poverty, but it's one of the highest places where people could go back into poverty very quickly with something like an extreme event, like a drought or a flood. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. I, I remember meeting this, this man who's, um, who was living in one of the villages that had been displaced by the dam. And we were talking about development and he said, development for whom? We don't need electricity here. Like I can raise my own pigs. We have, we have a river right here where I can fish. We have a forest here. I mean, this was an, this was an area that was like very wealthy in natural resources. We have the forest here that like for generations, my family can like collect resin from, can collect. And we're, we're like, we've been doing just fine. And of course that's not the case for everyone, but th those people were then moved to a relocation site and yes, on paper, oh, now they have an income, but they are so much worse off by almost any metric, many of them, not all, than living in an area that was like naturally productive where they worked with the lands successfully. Um, yeah, and I think maybe um, to go back to that question, like some of the other indicators we might want to look at are just like access to resources and access to both natural resources, but also, um, you know, financial resources that are not um, predatory and everything. So, um, well, I think we have time for one or two more questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask you this one that's a very, very big question. And um, Abby, what do you see as being the first step toward action? Is that prevention of illegal fishing, being environmentally friendly, getting rid of hydropower dams or something else altogether? I think illegal fishing is, is a really big thing, but it's important that, um, that the enforcement is of large scale, not small scale. Um, I think some kind of support to mitigate the effects of that would be very helpful. Anything that could help fishers um, get a little bit more income so that, but one of the biggest problems is because the fishing has gotten so bad, if you're a really small fisher, you're pro you may well be doing some type of illegal fishing because you're just not gonna catch a fish with say a, a legal size net. Um, but you're, you're just catching the minimum amount for your family. Um, and so these, these large scale crackdowns of illegal fishing, they, they tend to really hurt the poorest. So I think if that happens, it, it has to come with some kind of support to allow people to support themselves while the lake regenerates. But again, you really need to go after the big people. Like, we, like what we saw with these flooded forests, it's big people that are causing big issues and it's the small people who are sort of like need need to use it because it's all that they have access to. Um, hydropower dams, yeah, would be great to stop building them on the tributaries. Um, they exist, but you know, there's a lot of discussion on how like uh, lower Mekong nations could work with China, which has been um, kind of like fairly agreeable and, and more and more willing to work with them to release water when it's needed downstream. Um, so obviously that's like at a cost to China because they want it for electricity generation. But I, I think China does want to be a good neighbor in this regard. Um, so that type of collaboration is really important. And then um, those are like probably the most immediate actions um, you know, climate change, that's the million dollar question. Yeah, and I thought what was, um, you know, your point about the illegal fishing and cracking down on the large, um, larger entities that that the problem of, of corruption, it seems so rooted and so um, intractable. Uh, 
in terms of how to get get past that, which would be necessary to enforce uh, any kind of the, all the policies that you were talking about. Um, so I um, know we're out of time here, and I just wanted to encourage those who still had questions, um, either in the Q and A or others, that um, feel free to reach out to us, and hopefully we can answer some of them. I'm so I'm just like so excited to see there's so many questions and there, there's <laughs> great questions and um, please like find me on email or Twitter or um, I would like really be happy to continue these discussions with any of you. Um, I'm, I'm really I'm really like touched by how engaged everyone's been and I'm so, sorry this is short. <laughs> it is too short but I already told Abby that we're going to invite her back in person and um, maybe we can hold some kind of a, a panel discussion with uh, with some of the researchers here and that would be um, would be great to have your expertise um, and I'm, I'm involved with um, some of the work that we're doing too so I hope we can we can do that. Um, I think Laurel, are we turning it back to you or uh, there she is? Okay. Thank you everyone for the questions and thank you, Abby, for a wonderful um, discussion. Thank you for, thank you, Sabina. Those were just wonderful questions. I'm really grateful for your thoroughness and thoughtfulness. Yes, thank you again both for taking some time out of your night um, to be able to have this discussion with us all. Um, and did you say um, for people to reach out for you via email or did you say Twitter? Yes. Um, I can just drop my email in the chat. Uh, how can I do I'll drop mine too here? Um, I apologize in advance if it takes some time to get back to you, but we'll get back to everyone. Um, Thank you so much. Um, and so everyone, if you would like to reach out, definitely take down um, your emails that are in the chat. Um, and just thank you once again um, for being with us tonight. Um, and I hope you both have a great night and rest of your week. Thank you for hosting. Thank you, Laurel. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. <laughs>